Okay, it looks like we are now live. Uh, so to everyone who's turned up, welcome. It's great to see you. Well, not, I can't see you, but I imagine that you're there and that you're as pretty as ever. Um, thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. And uh, my name's Dan Munro, if you haven't met or heard of me yet. I'm a coach based out of New Zealand. And um, I'm really, yeah, really stoked to be presenting this with uh, Dr. Carol Morgan um, today, uh, where we're going to be talking about your questions to do with confidence and how to get through the setbacks and the disappointments that life throws at us and how to come out of those situations stronger than before. So my name's Dan. It's great to see you, and I'll, I'll put the Carol now. Thanks, Dan. Hi, I am Carol Morgan. Like he said, um, some of you may not know me either. I um, I am not in New Zealand. I am in the United States in Dayton, Ohio, and I am a professor at Wright State University. And I teach communication classes um, about lots of different things, interpersonal and um, gender and media, but. I, beyond that, I go and do a lot of other things too, like um, motivational articles and coaching and I write books, so I'm kind of like all over the place with the stuff I do, but um, I think the reason we came up with this idea for this webinar is based on one of the articles that I wrote, which I got a lot of response to, which was 13 things to remember when life gets rough, and so Dan and I thought that that might be a really good topic for us to do a webinar about, to dive deeper into it, not only um, regarding the article, but you know, Dan's done a lot of coaching too, um, so we can address some common questions and questions that you guys emailed us. So that's what we're going to do today. Dan? Awesome. Thank you. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to share the questions amongst uh, each other and just basically riff on on what we think is a, a great way to respond to these situations. We've got some great questions that I think will really apply to a lot of different people. Um, really common kind of human issues that we all face and don't talk about enough. So I think we'll just dive straight into them. We've got an hour to work with here, <clears throat> so we may not get through them all, but we'll do our best and we'll definitely focus on the ones that we think are going to be really, really common for everybody and worth talking about. So I'm going to flick one to you now, Carol. Um, the first one, this is a great one. And it says, when I get stressed, I start rushing around and I get myself more stressed with going on. What can I do to prevent that? That is a great question. And I've done a lot of writing and videos and talking about stress because I am a kind of person who hates to be stressed. I do know that there are a lot of people out there who almost thrive on it and they almost don't even know who they are without it. I am not one of those people. so. I can totally relate to this question because when I do get stressed, I do feel overwhelmed and then I feel scattered and I feel like nothing's really um, working and that I'm not really accomplishing anything. So what I personally do, um, I write things down. <laughs> you know, just this weekend I had like all of these things to do and so I literally <laughs> for like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I wrote wrote what I need to accomplish and then I <laughs> mapped it out. What am I going to do Friday? What am I going to do Saturday? What am I going to do Sunday? And I even put some relative times on it. I know that sounds incredibly type A, but it really helped me calm down um, because if I didn't do that, all of these things would be going through my head and I wouldn't know which way to go. So for me personally, that's what I do. And another thing I also do is I have to reframe things. like. You know, if you think that, oh my gosh, if I don't make these perfect cookies for my kid's birthday party or whatever, you know, nobody's really going to notice except you. You know, I think that that's what we do with stress is we put additional pressure on ourselves that other people <laughs> really don't care about. I mean, yes, there are real deadlines and yes, we have to do certain things, but, you know, a lot of people have that um, perfectionistic syndrome. Like, if it's not perfect, then, you know, it, I'm, I'm not doing well. And I think that's a myth. You know, there is no such thing as perfection. Um, you know, it's just subjective. And so, to stress your out, stress yourself out about doing things perfectly, 
is um, really kind of pointless, I think. So that's what I personally do, and that's what I recommend for people to do is to just kind of take some deep breaths, step back, and look at it really kind of from an outsider's perspective rather than your own, and to prioritize and schedule to yourself. So what do you think, Dan? Do you uh, have any different ideas? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's, um, no, that's really great stuff. And I think what I've got really is an additional idea on how to deal with that. Stress primarily comes from <clears throat> the thinking in terms of not being present. So quite often stress is related to worrying about what's already happened or worrying about potential things that might happen. And it's usually in that second category. It's that um, predicting future consequences or getting to the start of your day and looking at the to-do list and just thinking, I'm never going to get through this at all too much. And what you feel is a strong urge to start rush start trying to churn through it all like you'll somehow get to the end and then you'll be relieved and that's the myth because stress isn't about how much work it isn't about productivity it's how you feel about the work coming up that's all that's all it is so I found that the most effective thing to do with stress is actually to do the opposite of what you feel like doing and that is instead of to slow down and to really slow down to the point where it will make you more stressed. You'll be thinking, oh, I'm not getting anything done. And at that point is when you really need to even slow down further. So this is all about mindfulness. This is all about bringing your attention to the present moment and keeping it there so that you don't drift off into these thoughts that are worrying about the future or, or you know, panicking about the consequences of your past actions. So this is little things like... <clears throat> Really, you know, make make breakfast an event. You know, take your time, cook yourself something nice, do the dishes. You know, really just take your time to do all that. Take a good half an hour to get dressed and get ready. You know, all those things that you rush when you're stressed, slow them down to doing them even slower than you usually would, and drag out the day. And to sort of allow that to happen without you getting anything done, this will force you to choose done more than anything else you know it's this is about letting go of getting to the end of the to-do list and just doing the two or three big things that need to happen those things that you're most uncomfortable about what Mike have called um, eating the big ugly frog I think is the term you choose the ones that you don't want to do you do them first and the rest don't seem so important I think most people they look at their day and they think that everything has to be done so they just start easy stuff you mean that they're going to do everything uh, and then by the time they get to the big ones which have been hanging on your mind the whole day stressing you out um, you're at your least productive and you don't do them very well or you don't do them at all and you procrastinate so instead of doing that take your time doing the best things first the things that you're least comfortable doing the things that are most important for your results and yeah and just slow it down and by doing so you'll get what needs to be done done Everything after that, just like you mentioned, Carol, nobody really cares about. Um, nobody's even going to notice that that stuff doesn't get done. So I guess stress puts you in a really poor mindset when it comes to problem solving, and that's where you need to stop and go, okay, I'm not going to be able to figure this out, so to speak, because I'm stressed out. I just need to slow down and just do what needs to be done you know, first. That would be my response to that. I like that response. Very good, very good. So I will go on with a question of mine that um, some people have asked me. Um, it's kind of related to the article that I said, um, you know, what to do or what to remember when life gets rough. And one of the things I talked about in that article was the difference between attached mind and detached mind. And that is huge. I've been learning that, well, I learned it a long time ago. And it's easier said than done. Um, you know, I only wrote a little teeny tiny paragraph about it in the article. So I'm sure, I mean, I got a lot of questions about it. Like, what is that? Like, a lot of people haven't even heard the term attached mind or detached mind. So I, I thought maybe we could explain it a little bit better to them and how we can. Um, tell them how to apply it to their life when life gets rough. So, Dan, do you want to go? Or do you want me to go? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll have a crack. Okay. And, uh, I'll leave it to you. This is uh, one of my favorite.
about. Um, and when I talk about attach and detach, I, I use the word fusion, which comes from acceptance and commitment therapy. So fusion is like uh, if you've welded something, you've fused things together. And fusion with a thought is where you zoom in into a thought and you repeat it so often that it becomes your whole reality. It's like it's the only thought you've got. And that's fusion. It's turning a thought into something more than just a temporary in your head and turning it into a story that's the truth. Um, and diffusion, or becoming detached, is about understanding that a thought is just a thought. And when you can really understand that concept, you can allow thoughts to slide off your mind, just like all the other sensations that come and go. You know, temperature, mood, these are all things that just come and go, they're temporary states, until we fuse onto them, just like a thought. So a thought like I'm useless, I can't do this, it can come and go just like any other thought or you can latch on to it and turn it into this big thing. Now the trick to detaching from thoughts is not in fighting it, so trying to avoid the thinking or trying to, you know, some people use say alcohol and drugs or sex to distract themselves from the thought. It's about and making room for everything else that's happening, you see the thought for what it is, which is just a thought. So if you zoom in on a thought, that's all you've got in your kind of mind's eye. It's just this, let's say it's I am useless. It's right there. It's this massive, big, vague concept, and you're drowning in it. What I like to do is, is use mindfulness to try and bring in other sensations that you then need to make room for. So something as simple as just if you're sitting there having these negative thoughts, start bringing in full sensations as well, you know. So you could feel the, the pressure of the chair you're sitting on or the floor on your feet. You can feel the temperature of the air on your skin. You can try and find different noises in the room. You can look for different objects around the room. And you can have the thought. So you allow it, rather than try and get rid of the thought, you just make room for everything else with it, and the thought itself becomes smaller. You know, it becomes less impactful. So it's like I'm having a thought that I'm used to, and I can feel that it's kind of cold, and I can hear a dog bark, and I'm having a thought again, and I can see this object, and I can do this, and I can do that. And in doing so, it's like each time you zoom in on the thought, you have to zoom back out again consciously, and the zooming out process is about bringing everything else in. And it's like um, Dr. Russ Harris says about this process, if a thousand times you hook onto the thought, then a thousand times you unhook. You know, each time you find you're thinking that any thought is reality, that's when you need to zoom out. That's when you need to realize it's just another wave in the ocean. It's just another thought. And you do the zooming out by registering everything else that's happening. So detachment is a conscious act that you have to engage in. It's not going to happen automatically. You have to choose to zoom out. And in doing so, the thought can still be there. You're not fighting it. But you'll realize it's just a small drop in the ocean in terms of everything that's happening. That's my opinion. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, this one, for me, too, has been a challenge to learn in my life um, because, well, I, I don't know if anyone out there who's listening has heard of the law of attraction. But if you haven't, basically it's this concept of um, putting your goals out there um, and then visualizing and putting your thoughts and your energy into it, not only like action-wise, but also just mentally and emotionally. And I've found, and I'm not going to completely talk about the law of attraction, but this relates to anything in life, I think, whether it's a conscious goal we're trying to achieve or whether it's that our spouse is not acting the way we want them to. You know, it's called expectations. And, you know, I think with, with human beings, it's this really, really fine line that we walk. We want things. We want things to be a certain way. We want our spouse to be a certain way. We want a certain kind of job. We want to be rich. We want to be whatever we want. But yet that and our reality <laughs> usually don't match up that well. Um, sometimes I do. Sometimes I don't. And so if you are you know, looking towards the future as something that you want, um, so many people develop this attached mind. Like, if I don't get that, I won't be happy. Like, if I don't um, marry this person, I won't be happy. If I don't get that job, 
I won't be happy. And that is giving outward things power. Um, you are hanging your own inner self, inner peace, inner happiness on something external to you. And that just will lead to all sorts of miserable um, ways of living because I'm not saying you shouldn't have goals and reasonable expectations of people. You know, you shouldn't put up with bad behavior from people like if somebody is abusing you mentally or emotionally or physically. Um, or, you know, that, that's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, within reason, things don't always happen the way we want them to. So to get so emotionally involved in the outcome of what we want or um, this is actually I'm going to kind of slip into another question I had which kind of goes along with what I'm talking about right now which is um, the concept of what is is and Buddha had a really great famous saying which I just love and he says it's your resistance to what is that causes your suffering it's your resisting what you can't change that causes you suffering. It's not necessarily what happened to you that causes you suffering. It's how you think about it, how you're resisting it, how you have that attached mind like, gosh, you know, I didn't get that job, so I'm a loser, and, you know, this is wrong. And so, like you said, Dan, um, a thought is just a thought. It's not fact. And that's one thing I like to teach people, too, that um, you need to, like you said, step back and say, your thoughts are not reality. They are just thoughts. That doesn't make it true. And the more you give energy to it, the more it does become real to you. And there's even science to back that up. You know, they say the more you repeat a thought in your head, the more the neural pathways in your brain get stronger for that thought. So, you know, I'm not a neurologist, obviously, or even a psychologist, but I know, I, you know, I teach communication, and I know how powerful what people say to you and what you say to yourself, how powerful that is and how that really creates your reality. So, um, you know, if you do have these negative thoughts about being attached to something like, that's not turning out how I want, that didn't happen, well, you're repeating all of those thoughts, that, and that's literally <laughs> making your brain stronger for those kinds of experiences. And... You know, I, you know, some people come from pessimistic families. Some people come from optimistic families. I was blessed and lucky enough to come from an optimistic family. And I don't know if it's in our DNA or if it's just that we were taught a certain way to think. You know, we were thought, we were taught to think and reframe something positively. But a lot of people did not come from families like that. And let's face it, we live in an incredibly negative world. You know, you look at the news, there's like nothing good out there, you know, if you just look at the news, there's plenty of good stuff, but um, so to detach, I think, from our, like yourself, we're like our own worst, worst enemy sometimes. I mean, I know also that I'm a big worrier, and I'm really trying to work on that, too, because worrying about something doesn't change it. <laughs> you know, I worry about stuff that never happened, <laughs> so that's attaching myself to an outcome that may or may not ever happen, and that's silly, but we are taught to worry, we are taught all of these thought processes that ultimately attach us to things, and that's what makes us miserable, it's not actually what happens, it's just us attaching to it and making ourselves miserable because of it, so, so that is my answer, so I'll throw it back to you for your question. Yeah, see, this is a really, this opens up a big topic for us, because one of the things that I learned first in my own life and then I uh, applied it with my clients was that I used to attach my happiness to my goals like you're talking about. Yeah. So my life would be kind of ticking along and then I'd get these spikes of achievement when I hit the goal. These spikes were rare, you know. I might say get a promotion which might take me two years, you know. Um, so the whole process up until that is waiting to get to that promote, and of course it never lived up to the expectation. It's not good as, you know, you, you put your entire life's happiness on this one thing on the horizon, and then when you get there, you're just kind of like, well, what's next? Especially when you're a kind of motivated, high achiever, perfectionist type um, personality like Oz or Am or whatever. What I realized is that, again, it comes back to how do you pr get yourself present. And there's absolutely nothing wrong to set with setting goals. Setting goals is comfort, you know, rather than being this shotgun spray of, you know, energy just trying all these different things. Goals will, will focus your attention like a laser beam. 
but it's in the process that you find your achievement and your and your satisfaction with yourself, not the end result, because often it's actually completely out of your control. You know, getting a promotion requires the person above you to hire you. You can't control that. You can influence it, but you cannot control it. Getting into a relationship requires somebody else to want to be in a relationship with you to control that. Again, you can influence it, but you can't control it. So what I recommend is Again, with this reframing, instead of looking at achieving the goal as being the happiness, look at the process of your actions towards that goal. So you don't even need to really measure the goal. Let's say the goal is to get married, something like that, which I think is a horrendous goal, but let's say it's a goal. <laughs> um, your goal is to get married. Rather than waiting until you're married to say goal achieved, figure out what am I going to do today to meet more people? What am I going to do today to um, initiate more conversations or expand my social circle or whatever? Things that you are – there's a guy I'm working with at the moment for similar types of goals. He wants to become socially confident. In particular, he wants to find a partner. Now, finding the partner is out of his control, but each day he can approach five people and start a conversation with them. He can't control whether or not they like him. He can't control whether or not they continue with that conversation, but he can control himself and his approach. That's under his control. And so at the end of the day, he goes, yes, I made five approaches today. And he's had values. He's done what's right for this goal. He's done the best he could within the circumstances. Like you talk about that kind of serenity prayer type approach. Um, I heard a different version of it, which was there's four ways you can deal with a problem. One is you can leave. So you can just problem if you've got that option. Two is that you can try to change it based on having a power of influence over the situation. Three is not having any power over the situation, but living within values given the restrictions. So let's say you're in prison, for example. You can't get out of prison. Or you can't reverse your sentence. But you can still be a good person in prison if you want to. And four, which is what most people do, is you can fight against it and generally just make the problem worse. And two and three that you grow as a person. It's in two and three where you look at a situation and go, that's under my control, that's not. Usually the stuff that's under your control is your behavior within the situation. Losses, you can't, you just can't control other people. Ask any dictator, they always get overthrown <laughs> in the end, you know? So, um, yeah, I think this is just such a great thing. One of the things we taught about with goals is that until the goal's achieved, you're not good enough. You know, once the goal is achieved, yes, now you get the certificate of validation. Try bring it down to a daily process that you measure yourself against. This also has the great side effect of stopping you from caring what other people think. You're so busy measuring your own actions that you just don't have room for other people's feedback on that. Or when you do seek feedback, it's on purpose. You're going to certain people who are experts and getting their reflection on your behavior rather than just listening to everybody's crap or more likely mind reading what people are thinking, judging yourself on something that doesn't even exist. Um, yeah, so that's that's a great one. I love that question. All right, let's move on to the next one for you, Carol. Um, All right. This is a massive one that comes out a lot for, for clients, especially just before they enroll for coaching and things like that. I'm always worried about money, no matter how much I have. How do I worry less about it? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that one, uh, Dan. Uh, that's an easy one. <laughs> no, um, oh, that is a huge question. And, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who really do not have any money. Um, I mean, I think the statistics are that, like, half of the world's population lives on less than, like, $750 a year, you know, so if anyone out there watching is making more than that, you are technically privileged in the world, even though it doesn't feel like it, I'm sure. Um, so... I don't know if anyone has heard of or read the book Secrets of the Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Eker, but it's a great book. I would highly recommend it. And he talks about how money is um, a reflection of our inner world, you know, our, our inner thoughts. And so whether we stress about money or whether we're at peace with money um, really starts with us. 
And I know people who have plenty of money. I mean, they don't want for anything. And they go around talking about how poor they are. And I, I, I don't say anything, but I'm in my head thinking, really? You have a great job, a beautiful house, uh, you know, a great family. Like, I'm looking at all the stuff they do have, all the great stuff they do have, and all they can think about is, I don't have any money, I'm poor. And so sometimes, sometimes being poor is a mindset. Um, yes, I know if you really don't make a lot of money, you can't feed yourself or your children. Yes, that that's a problem, but um, at least in this book, T. Harvecker talks about how a lot of us um, really have this, I think he calls it like a thermostat for money, like we are programmed to make a certain amount of money, you know, maybe you grew up really poor and so you saw your family struggle to make money and not that you don't have the opportunity or couldn't have the opportunity to be very successful when you grow up, but you've been programmed around the concept of money to struggle. And in some of the workshops and, and seminars that I do, I talk about this and I do a process with them and I, I have them complete sentences and one of them is, you know, money is and then one is rich people are, and I tell them to just like the first thing that comes into their mind, you know, what do you think? And it's shocking how many people um, are shocked how negative their thoughts are about money. Um, you know, money doesn't grow on trees, or money is the root of all evil, or rich people are snobs, or even if you say rich people are lucky, if you don't see yourself as a lucky person, you're probably not subconsciously going to let yourself achieve money because you don't want to be. Well, if you think rich people are snobs, well, you don't want to be a snob, so subconsciously you don't um, think about it that way. So I know I'm getting kind of like woo-woo about money, um, but I think that book really encompasses everything I think of. And I'm not saying that there have been times in my life I haven't worried about money. I think we all have. Um, like even right now, I, I've done an investment thing that is really um, not going well, and I'm I'm stressing about like, am I ever going to get my money back? Probably not. But then I just have to sit back and say, well, I still have a roof over my head. You know, I still have food on the table. I, you know, I'm not starving. I, I even if I was, I still have people who would help me. Um, so I think when you reframe it like that, like, okay, what's the worst that can happen? If you go bankrupt, if you lose your house, if you don't have any food, well, you know, a lot of countries have government programs that will feed you. Um, you know, there are homeless shelters. There are hopefully you have family, people who will take you in. So sometimes when we go to worst case scenario, whatever it might be, whether it's money or something else, if we can go there and say, well, okay, if that happened, I'd be all right. Because I think sometimes what we fear the most is um, – the possibility of it, or, or our inability to be able to cope with what happens. And again, kind of going back to one of our earlier questions, that just doesn't help anything. You're just putting more negative energy out there. So, um, you know, I could probably talk forever about money, and, you know, I don't mean to um, make light of people who do have real money problems, but my advice would be, like, look at yourself and what kind of beliefs you have about money and how is that manifesting in your real world um, because that's one of the things I do is help people uncover these subconscious thoughts they have not just about money but about everything in life that is holding them back from success in some ways. So that's what I would suggest. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, I think that's absolutely spot on. And one you really identified that, that I was going to talk about is people need to understand what money actually means to them. You know, they don't really go deeper than it's having more numbers in the bank account and that being important for some reason and never really stopping to think, why? Why is that important? What does that even mean? And uh, I was watching, re-watching Wolf of Wall Street the other day and, you know, there's that scene at the start where he talks about how money's for gazy. It's, it doesn't exist. And it's true. Money is nothing more than an agreement. It's it numbers in a bank account. It's not actually a really a tangible thing. We think it's tangible because it comes in notes and coins, but actually it's not. Those notes and coins aren't worth anything. Um, and so what is money? And I think what you've identified for most people, it's in the high seat, and this is a big guesstimation, the beliefs around money were formed in childhood. They were formed by your childhood and the kind of... Um, 
approach your caregivers, parents, to money, that kind of thing, kind of upbringing you had and how you compared yourself to other kids, that kind of thing. So before you even had a fully formed brain, you had a fully formed belief around money. And like most beliefs formed in childhood, they're fairly inaccurate. They're not based on evidence. They're, they're based on kind of just seeing say misunderstandings. So I think what you've really identified, it's not about how exactly you make more money. It's actually about understanding why you want to in the first place. So a lot of, a lot of people I work with in terms of money, I ask them, what does money mean to you? Um, and, you know, we get to quite often it's things around safety and security. You know, money represents the ability to acquire resources for yourself so that you don't die, you know, or your family doesn't die. And for other people, or sometimes it's a mixture, there's also lifestyle, like money equals the happy things in life. Not, not so much that money buys happiness, but money buys the things that give you happiness. So it's pretty much the same thing. And what can be really helpful is to revisit, well, how can I achieve those sensations, the feelings of safety and security, the feelings of enjoyment, without actually needing money? What's another pathway to get there? I know by far one of the wealthiest men I know financially. He has so much money that by nobody's standards is he poor. You know, he's talking tens of millions of dollars in cash plus all his assets, right? Very rich guy. And yet he's not happy. He's still insecure. He, um, you know, he abuses alcohol. He um, steps out on his wife. He, he does all the typical like life crisis cars he buys and all that sort of stuff. He, he's, he's like a cartoon, really. Great guy, really great guy, but he has this kind of weakness. And he's proof that there's no actual amount of money that will make that feeling go away. It has nothing to do with the number of, of, of money you have sort of thing. You know, my, my income has gone up and down over the years. You know, I went well up just as I was progressing my career, and that crashed again when I went to full-time coaching. Um, <laughs> it's been a, an absolute sort of thing. Um, and what I realized is that no matter what the number was, I felt the same about it. So even when I was earning a lot, I was still, you know, I've never really cared about money, and I didn't care about it no matter how much I had. And that's just because I've been raised in a household where you find your enjoyment through the free things, you know, so I was blessed in that sense. I had no choice in that. I can't take any credit for that. That was just luck. Other people have been raised in households where there's massive arguments between parents around money and all this kind of negativity attached to money, like what you're talking about. And ultimately, what you identify, that worst case scenario, another thing to look at is how much do you actually need to survive? Because that's actually quite a small number. If you think, okay, all I'm going to do is buy these massive sacks of rice and, like, the cheapest chicken ever, you know, and we'll stay in the crappiest house ever um, and don't have any form of any. You know, most families, I know there are exceptions, I've worked with many of the exceptions, would be able to survive. But people throw their money away on all sorts of crap. No matter what finance, they could be in tons of debt and they'll still buy themselves a new dress or whatever. Um, so it's not it's not an amount, you know, and it's it's not even the 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 way you spend money. It's all about how you how it makes you feel. So quite often people spend it to make themselves feel like they've got a lot of it, you know, to give, give them insecurity. Like, yeah, I can buy a sweater, even though now I'm got a massive credit card. Um, so what I'd say is, you know, worrying less about money really comes down to um, your beliefs around what money gives you. You know, and asking yourself, is there another way to get what money gives me? You know, if money gives me the sense of satisfaction, what's another way that I can feel satisfied with life? You know, and stop chasing this rainbow, this thing that a certain number will get you there. Because it just, in my opinion, all the people I know who have made lots of money, the number doesn't, it gets you past a certain level of comfort and security, but not to that total satisfaction. That comes from something else. Yeah, I would agree too. I um, I also know a lot of people who, like you said, are in a ton of debt, but they still keep going into debt to get stuff. And I think a lot of the reasons that they do that is keeping up with the Joneses. Like, I need to put on this um, mask 
or this this false sense of I'm successful and I am worthy um, even though yeah they might have a huge house and outwardly their their life seems great but if you were really peek behind the curtain their lives are just crumbling and I've known people like that and so I think that unfortunately our our world today values money way too much and we equate money and success and for me success is as if you're happy and um, you know, I've known plenty of people who don't have much money and are way happier than like the guy you talked about who's millions of dollars and isn't. So, yeah. So that's a great question. Um, so should I go on to my next question, I guess? All right. Um, so one of the things I wrote about in that article, too, is that you are not a victim. And a lot of people have commented on a lot of my articles, and you know most of them are good, but you know you get a lot of negative people, negative comments all the time. And this particular one, I got a lot of negative feedback about. Um, you know, the kind of victim I was talking about is not, you know, the victim of horrible, horrible things or a victim of a hurricane or. Um, but even even then. You and I, Dan, we've talked about how to get out of that victim mentality, and I know you have a really great strategy to help people, so I'll throw it back to you and let you uh, give some of your advice. <laughs> All right. Really putting me on the spot there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the victim one's a big one. That was a transition I'd make in my own life. Uh, as my coach puts it, there's kind of two types of people, a victim and a creator. And... I was the victim for for a large part of my life, and that was based on the general concept of a victim as somebody who believes that life happens to them. They're this kind of powerless um, person who's just left to the will of fate, you know, and just has to wait for things to happen and, and play the cards you're dealt, kind of the thing. Um, and the thing about being a victim or a creator is that whatever you think you are, it's true. You know, if you think you're a victim, then you will be a victim. Bad things will happen to you, uh, and life will go badly for you. you know? And it's really about one of the first things, you know, when I'm working with one of my clients to shift this mindset is before they're even allowed to work with me, they have to say to me that they take full responsibility for their entire life. And this is a really tough transition for people to take. You know, you take some, I've worked with people who have been significantly abused, um, traumatized, sick abused, you know, things that really, the kind of situation where you're put in a very powerless state, you know, where you're helpless and a lot of pain is afflicted upon you. And one of the, the sort of paradoxes of that is the only way you're going to really be able to heal from that is to understand that your reaction to it is your responsibility. Nobody else's. Um, at some point, it's it's you have to move from blaming the person who did it to you, asking yourself how you're going to deal with it and move on from it. Because no one else can do that for you. There's only one brain in your head, and it's yours. Nobody else can even get in there and do anything, but they can do things that you will react to that reaction is, is you, not them. And so the, the moving away from the victim mindset, there's somebody I was talking to online recently, and she just said, she said something very simple like, I've just started looking at how I re react to this. And I think that is by far the easiest way to put this in terms of how to get out of a victim mindset. How to, if you, you might not call yourself a victim, but if you feel like you have bad luck, if you feel that um, you are hard done by, that you know that you're a good person in a bad world kind of thing, that is the victim mindset. That's the mindset where you've got it harder than anybody else, you know, and that you've tried your best and it doesn't work. That's a victim mindset. And things you can do is to say, well, how do I react to things, you know? When somebody has a go at me and I get upset, it's me that gets upset. It's not them giving me upset. They're just being them, and I'm here to witness it. I then become upset, and, that, and that's something may not be conscious, but some part of me is choosing to become upset. And if I can start to, as one, one of my clients says, she's like, what I do now is I just stop and think before I react. That's sort of differently. She stops and she thinks. And quite often that gives her the space to look at a situation rationally. 
like someone having a massive go at you, like confrontation is a big one for victims. They feel that they can't deal with confrontation. But if you think it's not really a confrontation, it's somebody else having an emotional breakdown and I'm just here to witness it. I might have triggered it, but that was their choice to be triggered by me. And now here they go. And as soon as that, it's almost amusing. You know, you think, well, look at them doing that thing. Oh, that must be difficult. Maybe I should help them through this rather than, oh, they're attacking me and, and things bad. So when it comes to victim, feeling like a victim and actually quite literally being a victim, so a victim of crime or a victim of a trauma, a victim of a natural disaster, you're a victim until you decide not to be one anymore. You know, you can be a victim for the rest of your life, even though the event's long gone. The victim thing happens inside your head and keeps going. But at some point you can go, look, try and find a way to not feel like this anymore because it's my responsibility to do that, nobody else's. As soon as you just shift to that, you don't have to figure out all the answers, but that shift will put you into a place where your brain will problem solve much better than it's doing now. So yeah, that would be my, that'd be my response to that, is just a shift away from externalizing the blame for things that are happening inside your own head and not internalizing blame, just taking responsibility. Just say, my job to deal with this, nobody else's. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely, and I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I, too, have known people who have gone through horrific things in their lives. I know someone who was sexually abused by her own father. I've known, you know, people who have been through cancer. Of course, we all know people. I mean, uh, you know, I could go on and on. Um, and I know other people have been sexually abused. So I've known people that horrific things have happened to also. But I see, like you said, basically two categories. You have the victim and then you have the victor. At least that's what I like to say. And like, for instance, somebody I know who had breast cancer. I actually know two people who had breast cancer um, quite well. And one of them was like, you know what? Getting cancer was a gift because it opened my eyes to life, what I was not appreciating before, what I was taking for granted, and oh my gosh, do I just look at the world a whole better and different way. Um, so to me, that's a victor, not a victim, because she used that horrible opportunity or that horrible experience to make herself a better person, basically. And I've known people who have had the opposite effect. Um, one person I know, she, I don't know what kind of cancer, it was colon cancer, but she got mad at her husband and blamed him for giving her the cancer. <laughs> all of us were like, what? <laughs> so, you know, you have all kinds of people, you have the same experience, but you have, you know, two different people looking at the same horrible experience very differently. And one of the things I like to tell people is, um, you know, it's not a problem unless you think it's a problem. You know, turn that problem into a learning opportunity. Almost anything can be a learning opportunity if you choose for it to be a learning opportunity. Even the horrible victim stuff. Um, like I said, like the person I know who is sexually abused by her father, she has just grown leaps and bounds and spiritually she's an amazing person and she wants to use her experience to help other people. I mean, she is, you know, I don't know if she says she's blessed that that happened, but she, she thinks it's a part of her journey, it's a part of her life, it's a part of who she is. And she says, you know, I have two choices. I can wallow in that and be that victim mentality, you know, for the rest of my life, or I can use that now and, like you said, change how you think about it. And especially when, oh gosh, when we're children and when horrible things happen to us by other people, um, you know, we, we can't control their actions, but later on, if we keep carrying that resentment with us, <clears throat> we're only hurting ourselves because we're giving them the power to keep hurting us. You know, so they hurt us, maybe they abuse us when we were children, and now we're 30, 40, 50 years old, and we're still mad at them. Well, they're still abusing you. They may not be physically or emotionally, they might, they might even be dead, but they are still you're still giving them the power to abuse you and by not forgiving and not releasing that negative energy. And I know it's so much easier said than done. And I always say that forgiveness isn't something that we do for the other person. It's something we do for ourselves. So if we are victimized by other people, um, it's so hard to think about forgiving them. But to carry around that resentment, I'm sure we all have. I know I have had resentment. It's just like a heavy, awful energy to carry around. And so 
when you decide to just kind of like let that go, it just feels literally like a weight is lifted off. So, you know, whether somebody did something to you and you're still giving the power to make you feel bad or whether it's just a certain circumstance, you know, you can use it to be a better person, to empower yourself, to empower other people. Um, and like I said, I've known all people all over the board who've done variations of that. And again, I know we can sit here on this Google Hangout webinar and make it sound really easy, and it's not. It's a process. And that's one thing I think we should kind of tell everybody, too. Is it's not like all of this stuff is light to switch. Oh, hey, I went to this great webinar, and boom, you know, I'm a different person. You know, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> You know, we all do. It's kind of like losing weight. Well, ooh, I wish I had that magic pill to lose weight, but until it's invented, all we have to do is like eat less, exercise more, do what we can, put some effort into it. So personal growth and getting past anything in life is um, a process. And we've talked about that, the process versus, a, you know, the journey versus the destination. And I think everybody gets so caught up in the destination, whatever that is, whether it's not being a victim, having life go better, you name it, um, that they don't enjoy the present moment and what can they learn either from the present moment or what can they learn from the past? Things that have happened, quote unquote, to them, how can they reframe it and use it for the betterment of themselves and, and for humanity? So um, I think that's a, just a really good way to kind of look at the, the victim sort of situation or mindset. So that's what I have to say. You have another question? Yeah, oh, and I just say that was a really great response. I think that forgiveness comment really stuck with me um, mm -hmm. because resentment quite often, like anxiety, you end up becoming anxious about anxiety. And resentment, you end up resenting yourself for having resentment. You know, <laughs> right. past, like, I just wish this didn't bother me anymore. And you're actually angry at yourself at this point, not the person who did it to you or the lifestyle that you had or whatever. And... One of the things I wanted to share was the idea of you go back to whatever that trauma is, if it's a one-off event, if it's just mis you know, misused your youth or something like that, this kind of thing that you resent to regret, and reframing it by writing as to how it helped you, how it's made you a better person. You know, um, This is a, it's a really powerful exercise, and it can be quite difficult, especially if you're talking about something really um, traumatic, you know, like sexual abuse. It's going, how has that made me a better person today? And that is an act of forgiveness because you're saying to yourself, hey, I've made something out of this. I'm not a complete victim of the thing anymore. I had a um, great conversation with a friend last night. We were talking about how our childhood, sh childhood does. And one of the things that I had, you know, I was a, a people pleaser. I was really scared of confrontation. I was really scared of um, being disliked. And what that developed, one of the great things about that is I developed a hypersensitivity and emotional intelligence because I was so worried what everyone thought of me that I developed the ability to just almost read minds. <laughs> you know, I could I constantly moderate myself. I could walk into a crowded room and I can still do this now and tell you the mood of every single person in the room because I used to be straight about it. Now it's become something that I apply very powerfully to my coaching. You know, it's something that I can take away from it that a good that came out of it. You know, another client I had, she really regrets these four years she spent as kind of like a street kid slash drug addict. And she's go, oh, I hate talking about it. I'm so ashamed of that part of my life. And so I got her to write the story, well, how's the cure better person? And through that she decided she wanted to go and help other kids who were in that situation because she could relate to them like nobody else could. Very simple. Like anybody else listening to that story, of course that's the answer. But for her, that was really hard to see that. Um, so whatever it is you've got in your life that you feel that you've been victimized, ask yourself, why am I, what have I got that other people don't because of this? You know, what can I give to the world that other people can't because they don't have my experience? You know, that kind of question. But yeah, I love that. that forgiving yourself, you don't have to forgive who did it to you because that's not the person you're angry at anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so you that really up purely, and, and I think it's a great one to finish on because we've only got about 10 minutes left. Yeah. And I know you don't want to rant on this one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going through a heartbreak right now, so everything stems from that is incredibly difficult. Finding self-love after rejection, learning how to let go, forgiveness, all of it. No question mark, but that's that's what we got through. So someone's obviously just come for, uh, I think it was a, I think it was a moment that broke down um, after a very long relationship. 
and she's just finding it very hard to love herself after this rejection. All right, uh, we have 10 minutes left. I'll try to keep my answer to five minutes, and then I'll give you the last five minutes so I don't ramble on, because I could ramble on for a long time about this one. <laughs> um, being a communication professor, you know, one of the things I teach so much is, um, like, if and when you're a parent, or if you are a parent, what you say to your kids is so important. Your voice becomes their voice someday. So, you know, if you tell your kid, oh, you're a loser, you'll never amount to anything, that becomes their self-esteem. That becomes their own voice. So the reason I say that is because I try, I have, I have two boys, they're 11 and 13, and because I teach communication from very early on, I watch every single thing I say to them, and I try to build up their self-esteem, and especially when it comes to, say, bullying. I mean, we've all been bullied, dealt with difficult people, but it's not what they do to us is how we think about what they do to us. So kind of everything we've talked about so far relates to this question. So. You know, we've all been rejected, um, we've all been broken up with, you know, maybe some people haven't, but I think most of us can relate to being heartbroken, being rejected, um, but it really is a mindset. I mean, my way of looking at it is if somebody doesn't want to be with me, why would I want to be with them? <laughs> if they don't recognize, um, you know, my greatness, or maybe they do think I'm great, but maybe we just don't fit. Because I've gone out with a lot of great guys who just, we just don't fit. You know, we might fit friendship-wise, but not in a romantic way just because, like, one person I went out with, he's a great guy, but I'm an optimist, he was a pessimist, I'm a social person, he wasn't. You know, just those basic differences. You know, it didn't mean I didn't care about him. It just meant, like, it just didn't kind of work. So, you know, to take that rejection personally is... Um, it's toxic, really, because just because somebody breaks up with you or doesn't think you're a good fit doesn't mean that you're a horrible person, and it doesn't mean that there's somebody out there who would make you incredibly happy and, and vice versa. So to dwell on or chase after, I know a lot of people who do that, they keep chasing after the people who break up with them, and or I know so many people who are in relationships where they they break up and then they get back together and then they break up and then they get back together. So they do this weird dance and it, it can go on for years. And you know, I want to say to these people, there comes a point when if you're doing the break up and get back together thing, it's clearly not working on some level. And if somebody breaks up with you, there's a reason. Um, that reason isn't because you are unlovable or you are damaged in any way. The only reason that you would be is if you think you are. I mean, it doesn't matter even what they say. They can say, you're a loser, you're this, you're that, you're a horrible person. Well, just because they said it doesn't make it true. If you believe it's true, then it is true for you. So it really is about claiming your own power, claiming your own self-love. Um, and I think, unfortunately, not a lot of people in the world do love themselves. In fact, I know some people who were taught as children that loving yourself is egotistical and it's um, a bad thing. Like I, I have one friend in particular who was taught that, and so I've been trying to get her for years to realize that self-love isn't narcissistic. It isn't um, that, oh, I'm better than other people. It's, it's the opposite. In fact, I know people who go around saying how great they are, and probably secretly inside, they don't feel very good about themselves, and that's why they have to go out and say how great they are. And people who honestly do love themselves don't really feel the need to go out and tell everybody how great they are, <laughs> because, you know, they'll just notice it, I guess. So I think getting over heartbreak, letting stuff go, is all right here. It starts with you, just like we said, with money, with a victim mindset. That's why my theme, I have two major things, success from the inside out, and change your thinking, change your life. And it's really true, whether we're talking about any topic, it comes down to self-confident, like we said, having a confident mindset, loving yourself, again, not in a narcissistic way, but just in a way that you, you set boundaries and say, okay, you know, that whole thing, if, if someone loves you, you know, set them free, if they come back, they're yours, and if they don't, they never were, and 
find somebody who wants to stay. Don't don't keep them caged. That's that's the way I look at it. And my five minutes is up. So I'm gonna let you talk about it before we have to sign off here. <laughs> Very concise. Um, yeah, no, that's really really good. And I would say that if you feel that you can't love yourself after a rejection, then you probably didn't love yourself going into the relationship or during the relationship that person abused you emotionally in some way and got you to a point where you didn't love yourself. At some point, you attached your feelings, any good feelings you had about yourself to their approval, their validation. So as they go, it goes with them. You know, that's that, or it was never there and you just kind of deluded yourself by having someone there that I must be a good person. Um, and this is not a judgment against anyone who does this. We're trained to do this and conditioned to do this from childhood. Like you notice, you know, I remember um, in New Zealand, it's a real culture thing that if you actually cut anything you've done, you're seen as being stuck up. We've got this thing called um, tall poppy syndrome. So anyone who's successful mm. needs to get cut down. It's this crazy, crazy concept that just destroys people's confidence. Um, one of the best things I've heard about how to deal with a breakup is a real simple strategy is make a list of all the things you couldn't do when you're in a relationship and go and do them, you know. Um, and I think this speaks to a much deeper topic of living by your core values. Most of the time when I'm dealing with somebody who doesn't themselves and that's since they don't have enough compassion or pride in themselves, it comes from they know that they don't live by their values. You know, they know that they're not what they should be doing. If one of their values is courage, they know that they're wussing out. You know, if one of their values is honesty, they know that they're not expressing themselves properly. So one of the best things you can do is get to a point where at the end of a day, you know, any day, you look back over that day and go, I did the best I could. You know, there's nothing I would have done differently if I followed this or whatever. You know, so if you're if you're trying to find that self love after a addiction, it's again it comes back to what is it you can be your own behavior because you can't control anyone else. So what can you do to be proud of yourself? Not what can you think because thoughts, you know, they're a nightmare, right? They just come and go. No matter how confident you've got these thoughts like, you're useless, you can't do this, it's crap. You know, that, that happens for everybody. So it's all behavior. The behavior gives you evidence that you can't deny. You know, you might think, oh, I'm such a terrible person. You know, I'm, I'm, I never help anybody. Let's say you think something like that. Go out and help people for a day. Then you can't argue with it. You know, like, well, look at that. Look at today. Like, I definitely did that. I can't pretend I didn't do that. Um, and build up some real life evidence through your actions of you doing what's meant to be done. You know, and quite often that means facing your fears. Like, quite often people really don't like themselves because they don't stand up for what they believe in. You know, they feel that they 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 kind of bow down to others and stuff and in a relationship that happens a lot. Somebody like represses itself to keep the person happy, which means of course they don't connect deeply enough and the other person leaves. Um, so one of the best things you can do is, is kind of step up, get uncomfortable and express yourself more honestly. And at the end of the day you'll be able to go, hey, I did that today. You know, I still feel like shit after that relationship <laughs> break. Go, I did that. At least I, I can take some pride in what I've done with my life. Um, and a rejection stings, man. Of course it stings, especially after a relationship. Because, like, if I approach a girl on the street, she rejects me. She's known me point zero 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 one percent of my life. She doesn't know enough to reject me. It's not even a rejection. It's just something that didn't go well. But if someone's known you for seven years and they reject you, they rejected you, right? That stings. Um, but you said because they rejected you doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It just means that for them you're not the right person. And so, you know, what? why would you even want to spend a single another minute with them? You know, when there's, depending on your sexual orientation, about three to three and a half billion other people out there to go and try. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're not going to get through them all in a lifetime. You know, you've you got to get, if you want to meet the one that um, really connects with you, um, second spent with somebody who doesn't is a completely wasted of time. So, yeah, I think we're on the same page in that one. But understanding, yeah, of course it hurts. You've got to grieve. Um, there's a grieving process to go through. And then once you've gone through that process, understanding it's your behavior that will make you love yourself. It's doing what's right that you can actually go, yeah, I'm a good person. Just look at this measurable stuff I'm doing. You know, That would be my opinion on it anyway. I agree. 
wholeheartedly. <laughs> wow, we're about out of time, Dan. Unfortunately, it went really fast. Yeah, yeah, well, we're both um, people to talk, I guess, eh? And yes. <laughs> these, are, these are really good questions to look at, like, at the start. Um, we got the sense that these questions are really applicable to a lot of people out there. A lot of us have gone through these situations. And we don't have all the answers. It's just about continuing to question if your approach to how you teach problems is not working for you, then question it. It's as simple as that. Like, it's not about right and wrong. It's about whether or not it works. If it doesn't work, then you change it. It's as simple as that. There might be some people where they get to a certain level of money, and they do feel like they feel so that worked for them. Great. But for most people, it doesn't. So try a different method, you know? And um, I look forward to doing more of these. You know, we'll get people's questions in, and we'll just riff on them and um, just kind of see what we come up with. And yeah. Hopefully, you know, yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everybody out there who's watching, who has joined us. I hope you guys have learned something and we've impacted your life in some way. And if you know anybody else who couldn't be here but would benefit from seeing this, um, it's going to be, uh, I think, on your YouTube channel. And I'll try to put it on mine, too, if I can figure out how, Dan. So um, we'll be probably posting it so other people can see it. So thank you so much for everybody who joined us. And would you like to say anything to close it up, Dan? Yeah, just saying, um, you know, you can get in contact with either of us if you've got further questions. We're both on a mission to help the world in any way that we can, so we're mm -hmm. more than open to conversation. In touch with me, Dan, at theinspirationallifestyle.com. Um, Carol, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, they can go to my website, which is drcarolmorgan.com, and that is just drcarolmorgan.com, or find me on Facebook, too, or Twitter. Um, if you go to my website, you can find those as well. So, great. Awesome. Well, we'll wrap it up here, and uh, until next time, you guys go out there and enjoy the rest of your week slash weekend. See you later. Bye. Bye.